church uh, can be dismissed as we board that gospel train. If you're here today and you have children about the age of these little kids right here, you can, <laughs> you can allow them to go out and in the foyer, the attendants are there to receive them and to take them to our children's worship, a worship that is designed to minister them, minister to them the word of God on a level that they can understand and appreciate. <laughs> there was something I was getting ready to say, but the Holy Spirit said, don't you say that. <laughs> Sometimes you need the word of God to tell real you. <laughs> but as we uh, uh, prepare for this message today, I want to begin by just expressing um, to all of you my appreciation uh, to you for being here not only on today, but a special accommodation I think needs to go out uh, to uh, the Dorcas Ministry. Amen. The Dorcas Ministry is a ministry, and yeah, you can give it up for the Dorcas Ministry. Yeah. It's a ministry that you know, helps to uh, prepare our young ladies to be young women. Amen. And uh, they are doing an outstanding job, and on yesterday they had their Mother's Day tea. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I understand, I couldn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they had a glorious time. We had uh, I just, uh, it's a wonderful occasion. And then also, I, while I'm here, before I move into my message, I also want to say that even though we had a full day on yesterday, uh, many of the ladies of this congregation went and participated in the IU, <coughs> the Coleman um, uh, breast tissue sample uh, donation. And, and, and those who facilitated that uh, organization just wanted to give a special shout out to the Lime Street Church uh, for our participation in that. And not only that, as you know, we had, they had a town hall meeting uh, recently, and Lime Street was the facility uh, that housed that town hall meeting. So uh, the efforts that you made uh, during that meeting and even on yesterday went a long way toward making the overall event an overwhelming success. So I just want to give a shout out uh, to all of you who participated in whatever facet of that ministry and especially for those darkest ladies. Uh, we really appreciate all the efforts. And then all of you who came and supported our young ladies, uh, we really appreciate, uh, they really appreciate those gestures of those affirmations and those uh, encouragements. So God bless you. Uh, for all that you did on yesterday uh, as we prepare uh, to rally around uh, the passage that was read in your hearing, uh, Genesis, uh, the 8th chapter. Genesis, the 8th chapter, we're going to begin there. And I want to talk about something that I think is, is today is the day for this message. Today is the day for this message. And I don't know where you are in your life. You may not know exactly where you are, but God knows. Amen. God knows exactly where you are, and God knows where he wants to take you. Right. Now, how do we connect the dots from where you are and where you think you may want to be to where God ultimately wants you to be? We have to connect the dots. And several things have been happening uh, in our very midst in the, several, in the last couple of months. We have embarked on a spiritual growth campaign, and we did a, we had a three month, a two month campaign that took us three months to accomplish. <laughs> it took us three months to accomplish it. Now, as we embarked upon this quest to, to understand and to cooperate with God's plan, notice I said with God's plan for our spiritual growth. God's plan reveals uh, as we come to grips with uh, his eternal purpose. You cannot understand God's plan uh, for your life in its fullness unless you are able to embrace the overall eternal purpose and plan of God. It just makes sense that when we know who God is and what God is accomplishing in the world, we can have a better handle on what he desires to accomplish in our lives. And so, therefore, as we begin to embrace God's eternal purpose, we understand that uh, in order for us to be participants and to cooperate in harmony with that purpose, we have to be matured in the faith. Amen. 
And so therefore, we, as we embarked upon this spiritual growth campaign, we began to say that spiritual growth, number one, was incarnational. Remember that? In other words, spiritual growth, the goal of spiritual growth is for us to be more like Jesus. In other words, the incarnation of Christ in us. Colossians chapter 1 and, 20 and 28 talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. So if Christ is manifesting your life, uh, that is going to produce uh, a transformed life. A life that is full and abundant. And so therefore we said that uh, spiritual growth was uh, incarnational. But then we also said it had to be intentional. It's not just uh, you walking down the street and all of a sudden you become spiritually strong. I don't care how much you put a Bible under your pillow. You're not going to wake up spiritually mature. There needs to be some intentionality in every effort uh, to grow in uh, the likeness of Jesus Christ. And then we went on to say that it's incremental. We grow in spurts. We have uh, moments of uh, growth and, and moments of dormancy in our lives. But not only is it incremental, get this church, spiritual growth is individual. Amen. Yes, we grow as a congregation. But you see, every member has a responsibility uh, for their own spiritual well-being. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, the Bible says that we ought to bear one another's burdens. Mm -hmm. The Bible says we ought to serve one another. We ought to build up one another. Mm -hmm. But somewhere with that Billy Holiday, God bless the child, he's got it up. In other words, we need to take responsibility for our own growth as well. Not only is it individual, but it's habitual. We are the product, uh, we are the, the, the sum total of all of our habits. Amen. You see, as you develop habits in life, mm -hmm. you then begin to uh, develop a pattern of how you address and deal with circumstances That's right. that confront your life. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, if you build on bad habits, you're going to have bad behavior. Right. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So is he. therefore, it's, in, it's important that you, as the, the, the writer said, uh, guard uh, your thoughts. Because they become your words, and Amen. guard your words because uh, they become your, your, your actions. And guard your actions because they become your habits. And guard your habits because they become what? They become uh, your, 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 your lifestyle. Right. And then that begins to shape your character. Which ultimately will determine your destiny. Yeah. Starts with thought. Right. Develop those habits. We said that habit can make you or break you. That's it. So we have to understand that spiritual growth is the ability to have good habits. And also it's relational. When you came out of the watery grave of baptism, God didn't just wish you all the way to heaven. Oh, he put you in here with us. <laughs> he put you in the church. In the church. A whole, see, the church is nothing more than God's hospital. For all of us sick folk. All of us sick folk. And, and, and get this in your application today. None of us. Can I, can I talk to <laughs> you? Not near one of us. <laughs> We've got to Amen. We're not human beings. We're human becoming. God is not through with you yet. Right. God is not through with me yet. Right. So therefore, he puts us together in relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's in the context of relationships that I am sharp as I am. Mm -hmm. So one man lifts the countenance of another. It's in the context of relationships where we learn how to uh, engage in those 58 uh, one another passages. Mm -hmm. You can't love one another by yourself. Right. You can't build up one another. <laughs> He put you in the church. So we can then develop the key essential relationships that move us forward, spiritual growth and maturity. Hmm. And then <clears throat> spiritual growth is multidimensional. We are a total person. Amen. Mind, body, and spirit. That's right. And because of that, every facet and every aspect of our lives must uh, undergo spiritual surgery, spiritual transformation. And then we we pause. We pause in our study. And we 
added something very vital to the actual, the practicality of those messages. We begin to talk about financial stewardship. Uh huh. <coughs> to the glory of God. Because all of those uh, topics that we have discussed, they need to find expression in our lives. They need to find a way in which we make real and relevant the message of God. And what better way for us to find out just what we are in terms of our maturity is to check out our, our pocketbook. And the reason, and I'm not trying to you know, shake you down, but the reason why that is important, because God knows that sometimes we have a problem with materialism. We have a problem parting with those things that are dear to us. Yes, the Bible, we always say about cast your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Take your troubles to the Lord. Take your sorrow to the Lord. But what about that stuff you want to keep? <laughs> we want to take all that stuff we try to get rid of to the Lord. But what about that stuff you want to keep? Because so you want to hide, don't want folks to know you still got. So you have to lay that on the altar as well. So we talked about financial stewardship and the importance of understanding that. Let me say this. Get this. God loves you. Amen. Can we all say that? Amen. God loves you. Yes. He loves all of us. And so therefore, if God loves you, it follows that God wants the best for you. Right. But sometimes God can't give you what he wants to give you. Because you've got so much stuff that you don't need. Okay. And so therefore, it's important for us to, to have an attitude like God had an attitude. Mm -hmm. I have said that God so loved the world that he gave. Mm -hmm. Giving was an expression of his love. How do you express love? Mm -hmm. And so therefore, we had a parenthetical kind of little parenthesis here. Where we began to talk about financial stewardship. Because God loves you. And God wants to bless you. Amen. And so therefore, in order for you to receive the fullness of God's blessings, you have to practice proper stewardship over those things he's already entrusted to you. Amen. For those who are faithful over little, uh, look out. Because he's going to bless you with much. Amen. As you can demonstrate, you can handle it. Amen. And so now that we have dealt with uh, the, the pink elephant in the room, uh, the hang-ups, they get us tripped up and stuck up, and that's money. But now that we have a better perspective on how God wants you to give so that you can receive, that you can be in a position to give more. He wants to bless you beyond your wildest imagination. And in order for you to be in line with those blessings, we have to obey God, even in the area of stewardship. And so now we conclude. We conclude this uh, series on spiritual growth by saying that spiritual growth is seasonal. The question is, what season are you in? <laughs> spiritual growth is seasonal. I want us to realize how, uh, how a mature believer, how a mature church accepts uh, the challenges of walking by faith. If you are a mature believer, uh, you accept the challenge of walking by faith. And you want to be able to understand that God has a time and a place for you. Turn with me quickly. Uh, we're going to keep our finger on Genesis, uh, the 8th chapter. But I'll just go ahead and read that just for the purpose of bringing us, uh, to give us a good platform for this message. Uh, let me see. It says, verse 20, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart, of man's heart, is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore every living thing that I have done. Underline this. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, 
and day and night shall not cease. I invite you to turn with me now to the third chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. And I'll just read a couple of verses. It simply says, To every thing there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. <coughs> Let me just stop there and simply say, as a congregation, as an individual, first, I want everybody to repeat after me. Say this. Yes. Ah, I want now I want everybody to do it. Say this. Yes. It's my time. It's my time. This. Yes. Is my season. It's my season. As a congregation, this. Yes. Is our time. This. Yes. Is our season. It's our season. God bless you. I want to start by saying God's universal principle for seasonal growth. There are some universal principles that are already in place. Yeah. As we look at Genesis, the eighth chapter, we see those principles being brought out, even in the covenant promise that God made uh, with Noah. Mm -hmm. You see, we, we grow. We grow in spring yeah. and summer. Mm -hmm. And we are dormant in the fall and winter. Correct. Okay? Correct. Let's talk about that for just a little while. Now, we celebrated on yesterday some ladies who are in the spring of life. Spring chickens. <laughs> and even if you read the bulletin article this morning, we kind of alluded to that. Uh, the seasons of growth, right? Mm -hmm. But you see, in the, in the springtime, in, 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 the, in, in the flower of our lives, we experience new things. Life is exciting. You see, they not have a care in the world. But you see, those are times uh, where, where, where we're growing in. In the summertime is where we're being fruitful. But then in the fall, it's time to reap the harvest. And then we begin to be dormant for the next cycle. But you ought not to be in despair over the fall and the winter. See, because sometimes we look at the spring and the summer when, when growth is taking place and everything seems to be vibrant and, and robust and then we begin to mistakenly think that because we are in the winter time that we're dead. Hmm. See, dormancy does not mean dead. That's right. Let me say this. You see, in the, in the fall, when the leaves fall off the tree, mm -hmm. it's really making room for the, next. For the growth. That's mm -hmm. right. Deeper still, yeah. notice in the winter time. Mm -hmm. When it gets cold, see folks in California don't watch it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> but you see, in the winter time, when it gets cold, mm -hmm. and that's when the roots, that's right. see, the, the, the root system, mm -hmm. it goes deeper mm -hmm. and deeper, finding new sources of, of, of nutrients and, and nourishment. And the deeper the roots, the stronger the tree. Amen. See, when you're in the winter time, in that dormant, see, God is still busy. He's busy. You may not see the external right. manifestations of his work, right. but he's still working. He's right. Now, know this. Sometimes in your life, when everything seems to... Say uh, that. You have it. Seem to, to get a handle right. on how you want to practically exactly. understand and manifest all of God's blessings yeah. in your life. Yeah. But you yeah. see, that's when you have to take inventory of no. yourself. No. Right. How do you know what God is doing that's when you don't right. see anything going on? Amen. That's when you need to be uh, in your prayer closet that's with God. Right. Sometimes right. circumstances and situations will force you that's to right. go into that that's special right. place that's where only you and God alone and He is taking your root system. Yes, he has given you deeper uh, yes, nutrition does. and nourishment. Yes, he does. Communion with God. Yes, he does. Understand what season you're in. Amen. The root system runs deep. Mm -hmm. Roots grow during the dormant season. And we grow in spring and summer as a time of watering, a time of cultivating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got to cultivate. Uh, you've got to water. 
You've got to do all the things necessary to make sure those young saplings, yeah. those, those young tender shoots, yeah. don't get trampled, don't get scorched, don't get abused and wounded. Yeah. There's a whole lot of folks uh, who have an aversion to church or any formalized religion. Why? Because when they were in their tender, yeah. that tender, formidable days, they got abused and bruised. On, and now, many of them won't even hardly dawn on the, the door of a church. I'm just saying. Uh, spiritual growth takes place in all seasons Amen. of our lives. Amen. Every season. Yeah. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about you in terms of chronology. I'm not talking about how old you are right That's now. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm talking about where God, where you are. In God's grand scheme of things, understand that the challenge is for us to recognize, recognize what season you're in, Amen. Amen. spiritually, Amen. in terms of your spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Mm -hmm. What is God doing in your life? Amen. Amen. What are some of the telltale signs mm -hmm. that you need to? Just keep on course with what you're doing. There you go. Or you need to up your game. Mm, that's it. Deepen your relationship. That's it. Tighten up on your commitments. Mm -hmm. All of those things uh, will be given us, given to us as we recognize that's where we are. Mm -hmm. We cannot afford to have spiritual blinders on saying that I'm okay just because I go to church. That's right. Nothing wrong with going to church. Matter of fact, we have a tennis roll out there. We'll check your name. <laughs> but the point is, spiritual development, spiritual maturation is a practical thing. It has to be what's going on on the inside. It's going to find expression and manifestation on how you behave on the outside. We've got to recognize the season that we're in and how to maximize, maximize each and every season. Amen. Let me just say this, because God, God gives us an illustration of just what he means by that. He gives an illustration. I want to invite you to turn with me quickly to the book of Galatians. And as you're turning to the book of Galatians, I just want to say we have to see some godly illustrations of seasonal growth. What do we mean by that? Notice in the fourth chapter of the book of Galatians, a very simple yet profound statement is made there. And I want to begin at verse number four as I fight off the temptation to go back and read one, two, and three. <laughs> It says, but, when you see it start with but, that means you got to go back and read. <laughs> but it's your homework, okay? It's your, it's on you. It says, but when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop. I'm going to avoid the temptation to keep on reading. It says, but when the fullness of time was come. Now, in this text, he's really helping us to see uh, the, the, the difference or the distinction between the old law and the new law. Deeper still, he's helping us to see uh, the difference between being under one covenant Amen. and being under a new covenant. covenant. That's right. For the Bible says that the law came by Moses with grace and truth was realized through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And therefore if we're Christians and we are adhering to the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus we have to understand what has uh, made that possible. And then I want you to see that God has an eternal purpose and an eternal plan. Amen. And he works that plan out. Amen. Therefore, we ought to have some kind of plan. Mm. This church, we ought to have a vision statement. Amen. Okay? 
The vision statement must be a. It has to be scriptural. It has to be bigger than us. It has to be a God glorifying vision. We the Lion Street Church of Christ exists for what? For the purpose of glorifying God right. through serving others. <laughs> Making every member a minister and taking his message to the masses. Now how do we actualize that? Well, when the fullness of time has come. This idea of fullness of time, uh, the full time appointed by who? By the Father. The completion or the filling up of a designated period that he had already orchestrated in the mind of God. Why then, why is it that as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus didn't come? The man needed a savior right then and there, right? Why is it that it took thousands of years of human history to unfold before Jesus came? See, this passage where we talk about has everything to do with the advent or the coming of Jesus. Uh, the Son of God coming, uh, invading uh, humanity for the purpose of fulfilling the redemptive purposes of God. And so, notice the fullness of time that comes. This time that had been designated uh, uh, by God, the period for the coming of the Messiah. A lot of stuff took place between Adam's sin and Jesus' death on the cross. I think sometimes we wonder why. It takes so long to get a certain vaccine that can cure a certain disease. And millions and millions of people had to suffer and die before uh, that was discovered. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer this question for you today. I can try to wax philosophical with all it can, but I can't tell you what took so long. Because God said it didn't take long at all. He was right on time. According to his plan. That's it. Sometimes your time doesn't sync up hmm. with God's time. Yeah. But today we need to declare Come on. this is our time. Because mm -hmm. we are now walking in lockstep with God's time. Mm -hmm. It took all that time. But what was happening? What was happening? It was uh, just a time when all the prophecies centered around Jesus uh, were now widely known to everyone. That there could be no doubt that Jesus was indeed the fulfillment of this prophecy. Man. Everything about Jesus, hmm. every prophecy about Jesus was fulfilled in real time through his life and ultimately his death, burial, resurrection, and even ascension back to glory. Amen. All that stuff had been prophesied. Hmm. And then therefore it had to be rolled out. It was proper that the world would be brought to see the need for a savior. Sacrificial system in the book of Leviticus helps us understand that year after year after year, generation after generation, all of these sacrifices and atonement for sin had to be made mm -hmm. to make people cognizant and aware mm -hmm. of their sinfulness, mm -hmm. making them aware of their need for a savior. Mm -hmm. Had Jesus come the day after Adam and Eve ate that fruit, mm -hmm. there may not have been a full appreciation of the gravity of our depravity. There might not have been a realization of the deep-seated need for a savior. Sometimes we get stuff prematurely. You buy your kid all that stuff uh, for Christmas and all that kind of thing, and they don't appreciate it. But later on in life, they say, you know what? We had it better than we thought we did. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't have an appreciation. Year after year, man in their suffering begins to understand their uh, intrinsic need for redemption. The need for a savior, the fullness of time had to come. Well, the time, politically, of world peace. It was a time, uh, religiously, when all the other nations uh, came face to face with the uh, reality and the futility of all those false gods. It was a time when Rome had now conquered the world. First Greece uh, had created a universal language. Everyone spoke Greek. Koine Greek was, was the, the language of the marketplace. So the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. The Romans came in and because of their strength and dominance created world peace. World peace with our iron fist. 
all the things that were now in place for the easy communicating and spreading of the gospel. It was the proper period that this new system could now be made known. All of those things took place over the centuries. Even though you couldn't see the Messiah, there were evidences, there were signs that God was orchestrating in his divine plan and purpose the Redeemer to come. Hmm. And so therefore, in that illustration, we can see that God has an eternal plan and purpose. Mm -hmm. And he works that plan and purpose out according to his time. Mm -hmm. And if God has a plan and purpose, his people must have a plan and purpose. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when we understand the seasons, we can understand that we, as we walk with the Lord, as we are walking by faith, and that faith walk begins to give us insight into what he will is for our life. We have the boldness and yet even the audacity mm -hmm. to stand up and do things uh, that heretofore we've been afraid to do. But now, because we know that we've been currently escorted by Christ, right. we can do all things through Christ mm -hmm. who strengthens us. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Right time. Proper period. And the Bible says that God sent his son. The son of God. In other words, God sent his son, helping us to understand that his existence didn't his existence did not begin in a little manger. That's right. No, no, no. He sent his son. In other words, his son was already in existence. Right. Through the through the through the word. The word Bible says in John, the first chapter, and the word did what became flesh. Right. The presupposition that the word had already existed with God and was God. Right. All things were created by him. Without him there was nothing made that was made. So he sent forth his son. But he goes on to say, made of a woman. Made of a woman. In other words, human nature. Human nature. He takes on human nature. He takes on humanity. I like how Philippians chapter 2 really brings it out. Verse 8 and following. He, he takes on human nature. And he says, born under the law. And that's okay, that's okay, express yourself. Um, <laughs> born under the law. And one of the human race, but not only that, but he is not a partaker, a partaker of the human nature. Therefore, he is subject to the law of God. When Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, he said, I came to fulfill it. So therefore, he walked in accordance to the law. He subjected and submitted, subordinated himself. Uh, as the creator, he subordinated himself to creation itself. He did all that for us. Mm -hmm. And it's through that we now have a pattern of how we ought to live. That's right. A pattern of how we ought to live. So therefore, we need to realize that we just may be in an apocalyptic or a fullness of time season. Hmm. What season are you in? Individually? What season are we in? As a church, hmm. we have to understand that God is able to use us and to mature us. We need a greater understanding of our seasonal growth. For example, we said that God has an eternal purpose and plan for your life. But how do we take advantage of seasonal growth? Well, one thing we know <coughs> One thing we know, and that is simply this. Uh, Paul said, we proclaim Christ, teaching and encouraging every man, that we may present each man, how? Perfect, mm -hmm. or complete, or mature mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus. If we're going to recognize and fulfill the season that we're in, we need to continue to mature. Notice, the seasons, as we see God's purpose. <laughs> Understand that, number one, there is a time of entrance, entrance into the family of God. And you've heard the word. You understand that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And he loves you. And he gave himself sacrificially for you. Mm -hmm. And he was buried and he rose again the third day. <laughs> and then we learn how to embrace that through what the Bible calls the obedience, the obedience of faith. 
The obedience of faith is simply uh, complying with God's conditions for pardon. So therefore we hear the word, we believe it, and it calls us to repent of our sins, confessing Him as, as Lord, and being buried in the watery grave of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. The obedience of faith. The complying to God's prerequisites for pardon. We can talk about all of that. But once we've done that, uh, we are now ushered into the family of God. Mm -hmm. That is a fellowship. See, all of this redemptive stuff, all of this being baptized for the forgiveness of sin and all this salvation, all of that is not the end in and of itself. That's right. It's simply a means to an end. Right. Church, understand the greatest, uh, the end result is communion and fellowship with God. Amen. Fellowship with God. And that in order to have fellowship with God, there's some unfinished business. Your sins need to be washed away. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, it's the sin that has separated you from God in the first place. Isaiah said that. And so therefore, if we can address the sin problem, if we can take out of the way the thing that it calls separation, we can now have a restoration of the fellowship. So Jesus steps in and he died for you and I. So therefore, he can take out of the way that which had offended God, which is your sin. And because your sin being washed away, now we can have fellowship with God. And so therefore, when we come in to the uh, community of faith, the family of God, we now have membership that's redemptive. That's redemptive. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And now we can celebrate, even before we get to glory, we can celebrate right now as the family of God. Amen. Somebody ought to want to celebrate today. Amen. You were in the family of God. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But not only that, once you get in here, you might be like a deer in headlights. See, we have an issue that we have to address. It's called retention. And that retention factor is sometimes when you come in uh, to this fellowship, this family, you have divorced yourself from your previous family in the world. And therefore, if you try to uh, annex yourself from a former lifestyle, you come in here with a whole bunch of strangers. Folk you don't know. Folk you have no relationship with. And so therefore, it's important uh, that we go through what I call the confirmation stage. Understand that when you're a new person in Christ, there's some great things that God wants to do with your life. Mm -hmm. But also you want to understand that Satan is lurking around the corner. Mm -hmm. He wants to sift you like wheat. Mm -hmm. He wants to bruise you. He wants to take you captive. Mm -hmm. He wants you back. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we have to go through uh, uh, different things, exercises to make sure that you're now not just a member, but you are maturing as a member in the body of Christ. You must mature. You must grow. You must mature and move. You have to be confirmed in your faith. The helmet of salvation must be properly fitted on your head. That's right. Simply a conf an understanding of who you are in Christ Jesus. And when you know who you are, no one can just no one can just call me anything. I know my name is Gino very well. You call me something else. Wait a minute. That's not my name. Okay. I respond. See, when you know who, what your name is, saints, Christians, you don't hear anybody call. Amen. You gotta understand who you are. That's it. And then not only confirmation, but also commitment. See, once you mature in Christ, uh, you are growing in Christ, you also now engage in service for Christ. Mm -hmm. The emphasis shifts from what's in it for me to what do I give back to the church. That's when we engage in ministry, engage in service. It's the word that we get the word participation from. We're now participating in ministry. You're saying that how do I fit into this greatest scheme of things? What is my role? What can I do? Not, you know, what you can do for me, what I can do for the call of Christ. Right. We need soldiers who stand up saying, I want to be involved in this, that, and the other, which does not mean. Which does not mean. I've got to find out where all the ministries are in this church and see if I can get to be a part of one of them. No, I don't mean that. See, there's a greater ministry in this church that hasn't even started yet. Because God has brought you here hmm. to usher in ministry. See, God has given you a certain heart. Hmm. Which one of these are you? He's given you a certain heart and compassion. 
That you may be able to bring to the table what God has implanted in your heart. Mm -hmm. In your spirit. Mm -hmm. Your purpose. What God wants to do in your life. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we come in and we begin to serve. And then not only do we have commitment to God's purpose, but also a commitment to discipleship. Mm -hmm. This is a phase we call a leadership stage. Where you are now uh, investing your life into the lives of others. You are now... Helping other people to mature. You are now walking with people and encouraging people and helping them to see Christ in you, in your everyday experience. Amen. Leadership. You go out now, you're a soul winner. You are now understanding and appreciating the fact that you've been saved. And you don't just sit around here being saved. You now go out and try to affect the salvation of others. Amen. That's when we know that you're mature. You see? Uh, maturity, a sign of maturity is what? The ability to reproduce. Mm -hmm. When a, a, a tree matures, it begins to produce fruit. Right. So, yes, we understand there is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. So we do need love and temperance and uh, brotherly kindness and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But see, when the fruit of the Spirit manifests itself in your life, there is another kind of fruit mm -hmm. that Jesus is interested in. But he said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. In other words, we now need to bring fruit into the kingdom. Right. We need to bring, uh, as God has perfected us, mm -hmm. now we let our light shine before men as a draw to God. Mm -hmm. And so, there are several ways that we can do that in a very, very practical way. Uh, we've just, the last 30 days, we've been in a financial stewardship campaign. We need to have a campaign. How do I love my church campaign? <laughs> how will we just talk about how we show greater love for the church? Right. Nothing wrong with that. How we love our community uh, campaign? How do we first experience camp a community within our midst? And how does that feeling and sense of community within our ranks manifest itself in greater community abroad? We have Bible for that. Bible says they will praise in God and have a faith with all the people. Mm -hmm. Not just themselves, but all the people. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the Lord gave them an apocalyptic moment. He gave them a fullness of time episode, a time of great gathering. Fullness of time can take place in your life. Fullness of time can take place in the life of this church, where God begins to open up the door and, and, and then people begin to stream into this fellowship. Why because? We are manifesting the fruit of our spiritual maturity. And finally, not only do we have campaigns, 40 days of love, 40 days of purpose, you know, days of community, all of those kind of things, different things we can do. But recognize this. All of those things can be just window dressing unless we allow the transformative spirit of God in us to have full sway in our person. That's right. I believe, I believe that God is doing something in this church. I, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm almost willing to wager that some of you believe the same thing. That God is doing something. He said, I want to do a new something. I want to do something. You know, God said, I want to blow your mind. He said, I want to do something that you have to attribute to me. See, let's, let's move away from just doing stuff that, that we can do. Mm -hmm. We have to begin to take a bigger shovel and dig deeper and endeavor to do the things that we cannot do Amen. unless God be with us. Right. And when you begin to try to take a bigger bite of the apple, when you begin to endeavor to do greater things for the Lord, mm -hmm. don't you know that increases your faith. Mm -hmm. It sends your root system deeper. Mm -hmm. Your dependence system goes deeper. For I know that I can't do this without God. And, and I remember one time we did a business meeting way back, way, way back in the day. We were in a business meeting and we were talking about some situation that we didn't know what to do with. We were all just talking about, you know, like a pool of ignorance. Well, we can do this, we can do this. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said, well, let's pray about it. That's the least we can do. At least we can pray about it. Sound very practical. This old brother stopped the meeting. Stop! 
That's not the least we can do. Yeah, that's the most we can do. Amen. That's the, sometimes we use prayer as, you know, last resort. Well, it didn't work. Let's go pray. And we say, no, no, no. When you are in tune with God, your communion with God is first and foremost. Mm -hmm. That's where you get your battery charge. That's it. it. I think it's interesting. This was not a slip of the pen when they wrote the Bible. The Bible said that early in the morning, while it was yet dark, mm -hmm. Jesus would, would get away from everybody and go to a solitary place mm -hmm. to pray. Mm -hmm. And Jesus would say some very profound stuff. Mm -hmm. He did some, some bold stuff. Mm -hmm. But before he did that, he was always in communion with his father. Mm -hmm. And he said, folks didn't understand where he was coming from. Mm -hmm. He said, you may have to, you want to follow me, you have to eat in my, eat in my flesh and drink my blood. People got an attitude about that stuff. Wait, wait a minute. Where, where, where are you going with that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, he was in communion with the Father. He was in communion with the Father. And those who followed him and knew him said, Lord, to whom shall we go? We know that you have the words of eternal life. He didn't go try to rally all the other folks to come back. You know, I want to get my message you know. It's our goal. To help each member to realize and to embrace and then even progress through your season. We're all in the season. You may be in the springtime. You may be in the summer. You may be in the autumn where everything seems to be falling. You may be in the winter when you are in a season of dormancy. You may say all is over, everything's over because you're dormant. God is still working in your life. Always. God wants to do a good thing. God wants to do an amazing thing in your life. Many times, uh, because of our failure to recognize the season, <coughs> seasons pass. Seasons of the harvest pass with the fruit riding on the land. Because we have not recognized the season that He's placed us in. Mm -hmm. Oh, but when you recognize it, mm. we're able to bring in the sheep. Bring in the harvest. Mm -hmm. All of this is to assist us, to assist you in grasping the opportunity within your season of growth. Mm -hmm. What season are you in? How do you recognize what season you're in? What does God want to do in your life? Mm -hmm. Make this thing personal. Okay. What is God wanting to do in your life? And then, how, what do you need to do to cultivate your soil, to position yourself, to receive the abundance of what God wants to give you? We talked about financial stewardship recently, and we said that God wants to bless you with more uh, than you have. He wants to give you more than you ever thought you could have before, but the only reason why he hasn't given it to you so far is you have not matured to the point where you can faithfully discharge your duties of proper stewardship and management all the things that he's entrusted with you in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so therefore God wants to give you more. Not only materially, let's not, you know, because hold this thing to just that. We use that to help illustrate the fact that God is bountiful. We use it to illustrate the fact that God loves us and he wants to give us everything that we need. Amen. We need to get in harmony with him and stop fighting against him. Let him have full for in your life. Mm -hmm. And that simply means that if you're not a member of the body of Christ, mm -hmm. you ought to be. Mm -hmm. You ought to come to Jesus. You ought to say, yes, I understand that I've been through a lot of my life, mm -hmm. but all those things God has been teaching me to depend on him. Mm -hmm. And now I'm willing to embrace the fact that Jesus is indeed the Christ. Yes, I may have understood it, so I didn't study school and all that kind of stuff. But now I understand for me that he is indeed the Christ, Son of the living God. I'm willing to, to scrap my engine. I'm ready, ready to repent of my sins. Confessing him as Lord and being buried in one of the baptism for the forgiveness of my sins. Period. If you've been coming to this church, we are so glad to have you. I, I, I can't overemphasize that. But we got to keep it real. We got to keep it real. 
I don't care if you're a fox in the hen house, don't make him a hen. He's still a fox. <laughs> you can be all around the church, but you need to be in Christ Man. to receive the blessing, Man. the benefits of the death of Christ. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's why we have to be baptized into Christ. That's it. In order to put on Christ. Mm -hmm. If you're here, you remember the church and you haven't found your place. You don't even know what seed you're in. You don't know how to be bountiful in your season. Well, then we need to start praying about that. Mm -hmm. That's not the thing. That's the most we can do. That's the first thing we can do. We ought to be praying about that for this church, for individually, and our family. We need to be praying that God reveal to us where we are and also the plan he has in store for us to experience fulfillment, fruitfulness. And bounty in the context of the season that we're in. Because if you're faithful in this season, mm. you're going to be even more bountiful and plenty in the next. Amen. Seasons coming, seasons go. Mm -hmm. Don't you get that? Mm. I'm going to ask that our, our prayer team come and begin to position themselves. We need to pray. I'm just saying, we need to begin to ask God. To give us the wherewithal to make a stand, a faith stand, knowing that God wants to bless us mm -hmm. and give us everything that we need. Amen. So therefore, if you're here today, and you know you need to give your life to Christ, well, you know you need to do that. Come forth and we are, we'll baptize you today. If you're here today and you, you seem to be dry, spiritual dryness, mm -hmm. You don't seem to understand what, what God wants to do with you. We didn't pray for you. We want to pray for you right now. We didn't pray for you about your family situation, your financial situation, your relationships, whatever situation. It does not matter. Just come. And we'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. We'll pray together. And as the singer begins to softly sing, and as we all stand, I'm going to ask you to make a decision that can alter the very course of your life.